Hey, deserving listeners, just me today. I thought I would try to power through some of your emails. I get a lot of emails, and I keep a very long Word doc of all of your email questions. And I have some time this month, and I thought I would try to get through a bunch of them because I like uh, checking things off of my list. Plus, a lot of you have some very interesting questions and life experiences worth sharing with the listeners. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am a professor at Antioch University, and I'm also a licensed therapist. I've been practicing in Seattle for 20-something years, and I've also been an instructor for 20-plus years. Um, this is a email from a patron that I didn't know if they wanted to be anonymous or not, so I basically just um, kept it anonymous. By the way, if you ever email me, you could always help me out by letting me know how you want me to, if I do read your email, how you want me to refer to you as. So the anonymous patron, she, uh, to, 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 uh, the beginning of her email, she basically talks about how she had a therapist that she liked and she got along with really well. But then she moved to another area and she had to terminate with that therapist. And um, then she goes on with her email. After I moved, we kept in touch a bit, some emails here and there. There was an incident where I went to an antique store in my new town and saw something that reminded me of my childhood, and it kind of freaked me out. And I emailed her about it, and she called and talked me through the situation. Then all of a sudden, she just stopped emailing, and about a year went by. I was a bit hurt, but didn't think too much of it. Anyway, last month, she randomly sent me this email. It said, Hello, I hope this email finds you well and happy. I have been, I have thought about writing to you many, many, many times to see how you're doing. I'm not sure what gets in the way other than I don't want to disrupt what you are doing in your personal growth work. So if hearing from me is activating in any way, please just disregard the rest of this email. I would love to hear about your progress personally and professionally. I have wondered about you often. I don't know what else to say, but would love to hear from you. End of email. Uh, end of email that she received from her therapist. And then uh, the anonymous patron goes on to say, I wrote her back a rather long email and gave her a full update. I told her about my life professionally and personally, and I also told her briefly about a male therapist who had abandoned me and made me feel bad. This was over a month ago. I haven't heard back from her at all. Is this situation odd? What are your thoughts on staying in touch with a therapist in this type of manner? Do you think she has any responsibility, even though I am not her client anymore, to avoid abandoning, abandoning me even through email? As I said, I'm just a bit baffled. At this point, I can look at things objectively and know that none of this is my fault, but it still sucks and I just don't and I just don't get therapists anymore. My current one is aware of all three situations, and I am confident that he won't do anything similar, but who knows? End of email from anonymous patron. Yeah, this uh, drives me crazy. Um, this is why we have professional standards, people. This is why we have protocols for this situation. This is why the protocols state that you do not contact your client after termination unless it's for business or for scheduling or something or you know, some kind of necessary communication. Um, in fact, I, I, I re so I receive emails like this all the time from l listeners talking about how their therapist has bad boundaries of various sorts, including this one, where therapists hold on to some kind of communication, open door policy, you know, with, with their clients. And the clients will, uh, um, you know, eventually the therapist is like, well, you know, I, I, this is a client I had from three years ago. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's really a great idea that I've, I've been emailing with this client every week. So I'm just going to stop. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and therapists have good reasons to do that, right? They're like, I'm not being paid for this. This feels like a boundary violation, um, you know, and, and then at some point they just stop when they should have not ever started it, right? That's the whole point. I mean, the thing that I always say on this podcast is um, the question I ask, in graduate school, what instructor or what text or what class taught you that this was okay? I'm guessing that never happened. I'm guessing there was never a point 
where a instructor or a book said, you know, if you just want to randomly and um, indiscriminately and casually contact your your former clients months, years later, you know, go ahead and do it because, you know, we don't really have any standards in this profession and there's really nothing to worry about. Uh, you know, that's never been in a textbook. That's that I'm, there, There's never been a, a competent instructor who would say such a stupid thing. And so that when, you know, I always tell therapists, like, you know, think about that question before you do something. You know, before you do something, think, was I ever taught anything around this behavior? Do do I remember anyone ever saying that this was a good idea? Because just going off your fucking gut feeling is not a good professional or, or you know, psychotherapeutic uh, guideline, right? Just because your gut says, ah, I kind of want to stay in touch with this client is not a good guideline. And and this sort of behavior just screams of unprofessionality. It screams of uh, unethical behavior. It screams of just like people just like acting like, you know, you're not your client's friend and you're not your client's buddy. You are a professional who is providing a service and you are holding, it's a huge responsibility and you could lose your license for various different, you know, behaviors like this. Um, at the very least, you could harm your clients, which I think this therapist is doing. Um, you know, for people with relational traumas, this is triggering, as the anonymous patron has. She has relational traumas. When you're inconsistent, it raises all sorts of natural questions. And you can hear it in the anonymous patron's email. She's like, so we terminated, and, you know, we would email here and there, and that seemed okay. And then one time she actually walked me through a trauma triggering event. So at this point, the therapist is essentially providing free therapy that's really open ended and not well defined. I'm sure the therapist didn't say, you know, um, okay, so here are the guidelines post termination. Um, we can email once a month, and you know, you get one um, a crisis intervention phone call every three months. You know, if you defined it that way, then that that might work. But I can't imagine a therapist thinking that that would be a good idea. But there's, but, you know, there was no defined uh, boundaries around that. And then eventually the therapist, I'm guessing, just said, eh, this feels a little funny. So I'm just going to stop responding to this former client's emails. And then out of the blue, just emails and says, I have been thinking about you all the time, and I've I've really wanted to email you several 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 times, and I'm I'm just you know I, I'm really curious how you're doing, and I care, and all this stuff, and then the anonymous patron emails back, uh, you know, so, oh great, you know she she she's reaching out, I you know yeah I I would love some contact with this former therapist. This person was an important person in my life. I'm glad that they're reaching out. Uh, the the client sends this long email, and then the therapist doesn't respond. <laughs> I mean, it is almost like, which I'm sure it is not, the therapist is playing mind games with this client. I mean, if you want to screw with someone's relational trauma, this is how you do it. You randomly and inconsistently contact them. You give them, you know, hints that you're that you really care, and or overt statements that you really care, and then you just pull away with without any explanation. Uh, you know, you're a professional, stop it. You, you supposedly, if you're a therapist, you supposedly understand ethics and you supposedly understand relational trauma. So what's wrong with you people <laughs> is the thing. Now, I don't know if this therapist listens to this podcast. I'm guessing they don't. But um, if you're a therapist out there, you know, have some dignity and have some professional standards. I understand that you care. And I've been there myself. When I first started out as a novice therapist, I, you know, the, the, the further I go down my road in my career, I absolutely still care about my clients, but I have it all under, it's all understood within the realm of, prof I, I've, I've sort of progressed through a lot of different ups and downs, shall we say, to the point where now when I terminate with a client, um, surely I care and surely I will miss them. But I don't have any impulse to reach out, and I and I just I I just know my role. I just know I'm used to it. But when I started out, I wasn't used to it yet, and I would have clients that I deeply cared about, especially kids. You know, you just feel so connected and so bad for them in in their situations, 
And I would tell clients, you know, feel free to reach out to me. And, and with some clients, they would. And, and I would engage in these, in these bad boundary relationships. Uh, the good thing is, is I, I never uh, randomly did that with someone with relational trauma to my memory. I think people with relational trauma whom I, I, had, I, had, I had clients with, with relational trauma and, you know, borderline personality early on in my career and learned very quickly because of it and really paid attention to that and really tried to get good at that. And early on, I realized, oh, you, with these people, you, you have to be very careful with their, with their attachment because if you provide inconsistency or if you give mixed messages, they will either go down a road where they'll eventually get hurt or, or they'll be hurt in that moment. Um, and and people with relational traumas will often ask for more contact with you because they see you as a, as a stable attachment and rationally just want to soak that up more and and they have they have an impulse to sometimes even you know they fall in love with you or they want to have 10 sessions a week or they want to email all the time or they want to move in with you or whatever you know that it's just a normal response for someone who has never had a secure attachment and suddenly they're faced with someone who actually cares, who who is not likely to exploit them. And so a lot of their attachment energy uh, from a lifetime of being abandoned and hurt gets poured into that relationship. And so if you don't understand that process and you're a complete idiot, then or you don't seek consultation or supervision around it, then you, you just don't understand what you're holding in your hands and you become this sort of therapist who randomly and casually emails a for, the former client and then doesn't fucking respond when the client uh, replies as you asked. This therapist emailed this this patron and said, "I'd love to hear from you. Uh, please let me know how you're doing." And then the patron uh, emailed back, and then the therapist didn't even respond with like, a, "Oh, thanks" or anything. Just like you know, radio silence. I, again, if 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 you're trying to mess with someone with relational traumas, this is what you do. And uh, now, I don't doubt that this therapist cares. I don't doubt that this therapist is a good person. Uh, the, the patron, uh, the emailer to the podcast here said that she really liked this therapist. So, you know, overall, 99.9% .9 of the stuff that came from this therapist was probably healing and helpful. But uh, so I'm not going to discount all of that work. But um, come on, therapist, like, uh, you know, be a professional. Now, as I've said in other podcasts, it's like if you want to give off a a vibe of casualness, or you know, or you're just not the sort of person who likes to follow rules. You know, maybe you shouldn't be a therapist. Be a life coach. You know, life coaching has no standards. You can be whatever you want to be. You can do whatever you want. Now I know life coaches out there will be insulted by that, but it's true. There's no licensing yet. There's no, you know, there's there's really no standards. You can really do whatever you want. Now eventually that'll change. And I've talked with uh, uh, what's his face about it, um, but uh, you know, or or just don't be a therapist. Be like a, you know, I don't know, a hairdresser or a bartender. They don't have any ethics regarding like this sort of thing. You can do whatever you want. But if you're going to choose to be in this profession, you have to understand it is a profession and there are standards. And the standards aren't there for no reason. They're there for a reason. It's, and um, yeah. Now, having said that, I'm, I don't like rules for myself. So I, I understand the impulse to sort of like be, ah, you know, rules, therapy rules, you know, and you'll hear me talk about how, um, I, you know, some rules I, I don't appreciate. Um, so maybe I'm a bit ambivalent about this as I think about it. But the point is, is that this rule is there for a reason. <laughs> this standard is there for a reason. It's, it's not there to somehow limit therapists. It's, it's to protect clients from this confusion. Because, you know, the, the, the thing about this whole thing is, is that it's a grieving process for both people. The therapist and the client are grieving the loss of this relationship. They both enjoyed those meetings. And the grief is real and it hurts and it's sad. And that's when therapists lose their ability to think straight. It's like, I'm grieving the loss of this client. I'm, I'm sad. Um, the other thing is, it's like uh, some, some therapists feel guilty for terminating and not contacting their clients afterwards. And it's like, 
you got to go to your own therapist for that because um, that's not a rational uh, thought. You know, if now what this therapist should feel guilty about is the way that she has been inconsistently um, communicating with this um, client. Anyway, let's go on to another email. Okay, this next email is from patron Dr. Penhos. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, but Dr. Penhos, 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 um, uh, emails. Hi, Dr. Honda. I have a question about retirement. I will be uh, 68 years old in January, so I'm guessing I got this email a while ago. So um, happy birthday, Dr. Penhos, 68 years old. I practiced general surgery for 25 years and retired to what I do now, which is primary care with a small practice. I love what I do and have no regrets about my professional path, but increasingly I found that I have other interests which I would rather pursue if I had the time. For example, I am an avid reader and I like to travel. Also, there's the issue of my health, which weighs heavily. I am in good health, but I see friends around me getting sick or dying much younger than me. In family, I have relatives in Argentina, France, and Israel whom I rarely see. They are old and could pass at any time. I have grandchildren, too, and I rarely see, and I rarely see them. You get the picture. Which brings me to thoughts about retirement. How do, I, how, how do I want my life to look like at this point? Usually, I am able to, to make decisions on limited information without any doubts, but now I find myself unable to solve this puzzle. My wife is eight years younger than I am. I always thought I would retire with companionship, but more recently, she took on full-time administration, which means she works every day of the year. I'm not even sure of her vacation schedule, so this has placed her even less available for our relationship. I actually work 30 hours per week and can take time off at will, so I could spend a lot of time with her if she had the time. I recently went to a retirement seminar where it was indicated that husband retiring first was most problematic. Also, my wife has no outside interest, and she really loves her work. I had planned to retire earlier, but now I'm not so sure. So as you can see, there are plenty of issues to unravel. The meaning of life, the inevitability of death, marital conflict, the definition of what one wants at each stage of life, my family, and how does one keep life meaningful as one ages? Uh, Very good questions. Very interesting questions here. I just uh, chime in a little bit about what you said about it's harder for men in retirement if they if they are the one retiring first. This is often a product of what I will what I'll just generally call sexism and the overburdening on women and the the sort of um, dependence that that a lot of men have on their wives that uh, women may not actually always have socially. You know, as men, we're socialized to work, we're socialized to not have friends, we're socialized to not talk about our feelings. And so uh, in general, on average, when men retire, they're going to suffer a lot more because they they don't have systems in place to actually talk about their problems, particularly if their wife is still working. And they also don't have systems in place to entertain themselves because They've uh, often sort of depended on their wife to kind of be their social calendar to some extent. Now, of course, this is this isn't all men in heterosexual relationships at old age, but um, but that's part of the factor. Uh, and also, there's this idea that men aren't supposed to do chores and they're supposed to have people do things for them. And so sometimes when men retire, they're suddenly faced with doing their own chores and and you know figuring things out for themselves. And so it's harder for them. Plus, men are forced to define themselves much more as workers and as, you know, as their, their professional life is much more a part of their identity. And when they lose that, they suffer a way more on average than women do. Now, again, this is all on average. There are certainly women who identify very heavily with their career, but, um, but on average. So, so there's a lot of factors that make it, quote unquote, worse for men when they retire, especially when they retire earlier than women do. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the overall thing you're ask, asking, Dr. Penhos, is the meaning of life. And by the way, I think everyone should be thinking about this, not just people who are you know, headed towards retirement. I think that um, teenagers should be thinking about this sort of thing. Um, you know, there's not much guidance around this sort of stuff, and there's, there's sort of a myth in 
uh, Western culture, or maybe around the world, that you know, you just retire and everything just works out. It's like this wonderful. You know, we, we've all we're sort of socialized to believe that not working is good, because when we're working fifty two weeks out of the year, we love that one week of vacation or that that one holiday where we get a day off. It just feels so good, right? It's like, oh, I just get to relax and I, I don't have to work. And so we extrapolate from that and say like, well, man, retirement must be totally awesome. I mean, just like constantly not having to work. That is not the case. Uh, I mean, for some people, sure, they, they find life and meaning and, and purpose and things to do. But simply just dropping your career one day and expecting to enjoy your life afterwards is is definitely not often the case for people. Again, particularly for men, because for some men, their entire life has been centered around their profession. And so so there's not a lot of guidance in our society. And our society tends to also just not uh, pay attention to older people and just say, well, you know, just put them in a home and forget about them. Or older people don't have any relevance. So let's, you know, let's just forget about them. And, you know, they're just waiting to die, that kind of stuff. Anyway. And one of the things that uh, really puts a sort of um, uh, makes this kind of like an emergency to you, Dr. Penos, is you're really realizing now that you have limited time and you're very aware of that. You're thinking, okay, I've, I've limited time left. My, my, some of my friends have actually died uh, younger than me. Um, I, I, you know, can't really, you're, you're a physician, so you understand that, you know, you don't have forever. And it's like, you know, what do you, what do you do with that limited time? Um, I have been th- just strangely thinking about this question since I was a teenager. I, since I was a teenager, I pretty much every day, and I've talked about this before, it's a bit of a condition that other people share. It's, it's, it's not extremely rare, but it's not extremely common in that uh, since I've been young, pretty much every day or frequently, I have a thought of one day I'm going to be dead, uh, whether that means leaving this world for another or just completely annihilated. I don't know. There's no way to know. And what am I going to do with my time? And so as a teenager, I was like, okay, I have, you know, 60, 70 years left in life. What what do I want to do with my time? I have, I have one life to live as the, as the um, uh, soap opera goes. And have always put things in terms of that, like, okay, uh, like my career, actually, I decided I was when I was in my mid 20s, I had graduated from the University of Washington Foster School of Business and, and was working in business and marketing and liked my job. I was doing market research, I was, there was like, um, math, math involved, there was surveys involved, there was customer satisfaction involved, there was, you know, uh, coordinating a a team of researchers and reporting on that to, you know, organizations like Microsoft and stuff. And, and it was, it was, it was kind of an exciting job. I had my own office, I wore a suit. At the age of 23, 24, I felt, I felt important. (laughs) And um, I wasn't earning much money, but it seemed like maybe one day I would. And it, it just felt very comfortable and it felt good. But I, but I looked at myself and I said, well, okay, I have, you know, in all likelihood, I basically have one career, one main career to, to do throughout my life. Is this what I want to be doing? And I, and I really looked at it and I thought, well, it feels good. And it feels like I could make actually a lot of money. And um, my friends are kind of jealous because I'm, 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 I'm actually getting a paycheck that I can, an extra income. And, and I remember at the time, uh, <laughs> just to give you an idea of my economics at the time, I was, I only needed $800 a month to live because I lived, you know, like a college student. And so, and I got, I got two paychecks a, a month for $800. And so the first paycheck I got uh, was just all fixed expenses, rent and food and, you know, gas money and all that kind of stuff. And then the next paycheck I got, so the second paycheck I got in a month, I could spend on whatever I want. And, the, and I instantly uh, started buying musical stuff. I bought an amp that I always wanted to get, this Fender amp, and I bought a uh, Fender tube amp. It was actually a kind of a weird amp that I don't see very much. It's, I think it's a, actually a bass amp. Was it called Bassman? And it has like four tens. If you're a if you're a guitar nerd out there, you understand what I'm talking about. You know, having four tens in a Fender, uh, you know, that sort of tweed amp. Anyway, and then I bought this um, this this really sweet guitar that was this 
um, PV uh, knockoff of a Les Paul, but it had a super thin neck and it had beautiful wood grain and uh, it, it was a, it was like a, a Les Paul, but it was curved and it just had a better feel to it. Had a great sound. And, uh, but it was made by PV, which, you know, I, I didn't, I don't think I knew at the time that PV is sort of, um, a, you know, people look down on PV in terms of their guitar. Uh, I mean, some people love PV guitars, but anyway, my point is, is that, um, uh, why am I telling you that? Oh yeah. Uh, at the time I thought, you know, man, my life is going great. And, but is this, is this what I want to do with my limited time? And, and I decided, no, this is not what I want to do with my limited time. I want something that's that's more meaningful. It has, you know, more purpose. And when I'm on my deathbed and I want to look back on my life, I, I want I, I I want to see something else. I don't want to see me just sort of enjoying a a businessy, lucrative career that earns money and and entertains me. You know, I I want something that that just fits more with the fiber of my being. And that's when I decided to become a therapist and eventually a teacher and a and a um, supervisor and a podcaster now. So, uh, and I feel com- now and have for pretty much my entire career as a therapist felt completely in line with uh, the purpose of my life. It, it feels totally worth it. I've never regretted it. Uh, I'll, I'll do this, ba- basically the way my career is now, it'll, it'll be the way it will be when I die. I, I don't doubt that. I can't imagine something else coming along and, and um, uh, you know, upending uh, my love of what I'm doing right now. Because right now I'm a therapist, I'm a supervisor, I'm a podcaster, and I'm a professor, and I'm an advisor of students. And that's pretty much it in terms of what I do. Um, I do some of the random gigs, but they're all kind of related to those kinds of things. And and I, I just can't imagine any other better situation. And, and I've been slowly building up to this at the age of 47. Um, and, and anyway, so I've always thought about that, and I think everyone should, and I think that's kind of what you're struggling with, Dr. Penhose, is like, okay, I have limited time, what do I, I want to do? And, you know, recently I was, I was thinking about travel, because I, I, did, I you know, I've, I've had sort of a, a ambivalent relationship with travel in my life. My, my family, when I was growing up, didn't travel very much. Uh, we would always go on... Um, uh, so I, I live in the Seattle area with my family, and they my, my parents grew up in Spokane, Washington, which is on the other side of the state. It takes about six hours to drive there. And so every summer, we would go out to Spokane to visit aunts and uncles and grandparents and, and cousins and stuff. And I uh, that was the only vacation we would go on. We would never go to, like, Disneyland or, you know, Hawaii or stuff, or even go camping. We would just... We just go to Spokane, and for uh, you know one or two weeks, we just have this family extravaganza because both my parents have four siblings, and so imagine all the cousins and the grandparents and the extended family, great grandparents and everything. It's just like this huge uh, ex- family, and we would stay with we would we would actually um, all sleep in relatives' homes, so we wouldn't even go to hotels. It was just this kind of all expenses paid you know kind of trip. But anyway. Um, so I, I grew up uh, not traveling much, and I find that when you are in a family that travels a lot, you 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 like travel more. So it took me a long time to actually start to enjoy travel until kind of actually recently, a few years ago. I was like, oh, travel actually can be kind of fun. <laughs> can be actually kind of fun. And so I was thinking recently, like, okay, um, where do I want to go next, and what kind of what kind of trips do I want to go on? And I thought, well, I'm 47, and life expectancy, you know, it's about 80-ish. And I'll probably get sick in my final years. So, you know, probably my final year on average of travel, maybe 75, 77. So that's about 28 more uh, years of travel left, which is, you know, you can really only go on one big trip a year at, at best, right? Um, and probably some years I'm not going to go uh, on trips. So, so let's just say 20 to 25 more trips in my life. And I, and I sort of did that math. It's like, well, you know, if things go well or on average, then I have, you know, about 20, 25 more big trips left in my life. And where do I want to go? Uh, yeah, and I, because I can't go everywhere. Because my list actually is much longer than 20 or 25. You know, when you think about like different regions of India and Mongolia and Hong Kong and Moscow and um, Italy and and uh, Sweden, because I, you know, uh, I'm one eighth Swedish immigrant, and uh, there's places in the United States that I I, I want to go back to, 
um, places in Canada, Australia, I've never been to Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, Thailand, Taiwan, uh, you know, um, Guam, you know, there's just all these places, Vietnam, da, 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 you know, the list just goes on and on. There's just so many places, Africa, you know, you know, got countless places in Africa, Egypt, South Africa, uh, Central Africa, you know, there's just so many places, um, Wakanda, for example, I've never been there. There's just so many places that, um, I, you know, I want to go. And, and so, so anyway, I'm just saying that I, I think it is it, what Dr. Penos is doing and is very worthy uh, mental soul searching activity, which is I have limited time. What do I want to do? And I and I actually recommend that everyone do this um, if you want to, <laughs> because uh, I think that it it is a reality that helps to galvanize your life. If you recognize that you have limited time, then you will not waste your time with stuff that. Are, is meaningless. You know, you, you talk to a 25 year old, 35, or really anyone of any age, and you're just like, look, if, if you were going to die, if you had one year to live, what would you do? A lot of people would be like, oh my God, I'd quit my job. I'd do, you know, I'd do this. And it's like, doesn't that tell you something? Because to me, if I was, if I had one year to live, I wouldn't do anything different. I might, I might spend more money, <laughs> I suppose. I might experiment with drugs I've never had. I don't know. But Really, my life would not change. I, I, I would still want to work with my clients. I would still want to teach. I'd still want to podcast. You know, I, I love doing this stuff. You know, if, if, if I was, you know, if I had one year to live and I was like, um, okay, I quit all my jobs, I'll start podcasting, then I'd wake up in the, in, you know, the next day and I'd be like, uh, what do I do with myself? I actually kind of like those things. Um, you know, I might be a little bit more, honest with people in my life, which tells me something, right? It's like, if, if, if that's something that I would say to myself, what does that mean about my life right now? And that basically tells me I should probably be more honest with people in my personal life now. Uh, why wait until I only have a year to live? Um, so, so I think it's a, it's a very um, soul searching and connection with the true you when you really contemplate the fact and recognize the fact that you have limited time and, and how that affects your, um, your uh, life now. The, now, that isn't without its pain. I mean, I, the one thing I'm not portraying, which I've absolutely had my entire life and what you, people usually report is a deep sense of grief and sadness and, and terror around the fact that we have limited time on this planet. It's, it's terrifying for most people. It's scary. It's something we don't want to think about. It's something that um, we have all sorts of ways of defending against, and it's sad, and it's it's depressing in some way. So this question is avoided for good reasons, but I think the struggle is worth it. Anyway, so that's what Dr. Panos is talking about, right? And it's a bummer that he's disjointed from his spouse, from his wife's path. That's That's just a bummer. She's working hard. She, she, she has a new job that she gets a lot of meaning from. She's younger. Uh, women have longer life expectancy. So she's probably thinking, you know, so if she's, she's eight years younger, so she's 60-ish, she is thinking, well, you know, I got a good 10, 15 years of a career left maybe. And you might be gone by, by, the, by you know, she might be still working full time as an administrator when you die. I mean, I don't want to, you know, say that for sure, of course, or to bum me out. But, you know, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if Dr. Penos, you're thinking about that. It's like, huh, I might not ever have a, um, the sort of companionship that I wanted a, a, after retirement uh, because my wife might choose to work uh, for a long time. And that, and that sucks. That's, that's sad. Uh, and perhaps shifting to other people is the answer. Um, you know, putting all of our eggs in one basket might not be the best thing there for you. Um, because you're sort of a, you, you, if you're sort of in a, for her, she's in a Sophie's choice because I'm sure she loves you and she would love to also retire with you. But she also loves her career, apparently, and gets a lot of meaning from that. So it's like if you forced her somehow or influenced her to quit her job and retire early, would she regret that and resent you for that? You know, it's a, it's a tough thing. Now, so some advice is, one, I have no idea what to tell you, Dr. Panos, because I barely know what to tell myself. So I, you know, just, there's there's no, 
you know, there's certain things I can say for sure, and this is one of the things I cannot say for sure. This is a existential thing. It's it's very personal, and um, you know, I, I I don't have any experience. I, I'm not 68. Myself. I'm 47, so God knows what I'll feel like when I'm 68. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what that'll be like. Um, but I, I, some advice would be therapy. Go to therapy f- specifically for this. There are existential therapists who specialize in this kind of thing, and it'll probably be worth it. Because the reason why I say that is because this is a very complicated thing that requires frequent exploration and time. There's there's nothing like right, you know. You emailed me a while ago, Doctor Peno, so I'm so please email me and let me know how you're doing with this. But uh, I would guess that this will be something that you will be thinking about and exploring and having ups and downs around for years, if not the rest of your years. It, I know I'm pretty sure for myself that I will be having an exploration with the, these very questions, yeah, for the rest of my life. I'm sure that when I'm 60, 70, hopefully 80, I will be, I'll be bowling these questions over. Like, huh, I have limited time. What do I want to do? Um, other advice I have is to really value this process for yourself. Don't downplay it. You know, just because people don't often talk about it doesn't mean that it's not real and doesn't mean that it's not important. It's very important. It's, it's the very meaning of our lives. That's a huge deal. And to, you know, to, to say what's wrong with me or how come I can't figure this out or, um, you know, no one, no one seems to really want to listen to me talk about this. Maybe I should just shut up. Like understand that this is the very central question in my mind for all of us. And, something that I have been mulling over since I was 16 years old. So keep exploring, keep talking, get other people in your life who value this sort of conversation. Stay connected to other people. That's a big deal for most people is, is, is the connections that we have. You know, when people are on their deathbeds and they look back over their lives, you know, they, they don't say, geez, I wish I worked more. Or geez, I wish I accomplished more professionally. I, got, I I wish I got more awards. You know what they'll say is, I wish I spent more time with my sister. Or I wish I spent more time with my grandkids and really got to know them. You know, these are the questions often. Now, you know, Doctor Penos, you're on your own path with that, but um, just consider that you, you're you're questioning that right now. You're just like, hey, you know, I have family members around the world and grandkids, and um, you know, I. I I, I want to be in contact with them more. What do I do about that? Um, so, you know, maybe that means spending a month or two with family members in Israel or family members in um, Argentina or wherever you need to travel to, to, to be with them. And that means not being with your wife, maybe because she's working full time. Um, the other thing is, is to think about work. Retirement doesn't necessarily mean not working. Sometimes you know, a little bit of work that you like to do, like you're a physician, so maybe helping other physicians or teaching classes or, you know, something that keeps you connected to your self-esteem regarding work. I'm, I'm guessing you have a lot of self-esteem regarding your work and imagine being able to sort of extend that th- through retirement. <laughs> right now, I just have to say, my dog is having a dream and she is uh, barking. So if you hear these little yips and barks, uh, she's at my feet and she is dreaming and barking at something. I always try to imagine what she's barking at, you know, maybe she's barking at the, the very existence of our lives. And, and, uh, she, she's trying to, you know, uh, comment on your situation, Dr. Penno. She's like, she's like, woo, woo, value your process. I don't know. Anyway. Um, so the other advice that I would have given my own path as I talk about it is be real with people. Don't be fake. Don't hold back. You know, be honest um, within reason. Of course, you don't want to hurt other people's feelings uh, unnecessarily. You know, focus on connection. Be real. Um, maybe think about your legacy. For some people, that matters. And for some people, it doesn't. You know, some people think, okay, well, after I'm dead, what do I want to last that from my time on this planet? Some people care. Some people don't. Also, Really, I think the central question that um, you want to be thinking about that I, that, that I found to be very meaningful and very helpful is when I realize that I'm going to die soon, you know, I, I'm in the hospital and the physician says, 
well, you know, your heart's working at about a 25% uh, rate, or, well, the cancer has now spread to blah, 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 or, well, you know, you are 95, so, you know, it could happen at any time. Uh, in all in all likelihood, given today's medical advances, a lot of people in Western society will have that opportunity to be like, oh, I now have extremely limited time left. Um, and, and some people even know, I'm going to die this week, or I'm going to die today. So some people... Um, I'm pretty sure my grandmother knew that she was going to die like very soon. Um, so, so a lot of times um, we have this opportunity to to really know. Oh, this is the end. And what? And 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 you think about your life if you have the ability to. And at the very least, as a mental exercise, what do you want to see when you look back? What's what sort of life do you want to see? Um, what would be not a waste of time? What would be a waste of time? When you, when you look back at your life now, is it, will you think anything you're doing is a waste of time? Now she's snoring. So if you hear any snoring, that's, that's the dog. Uh, one minute uh, dreaming, next minute um, barking and, and, um, and snoring. Anyway, um, so, you know, what do you want to see when you look back? What is it that you don't want to see? And... And then once you, and that takes a while to figure out. It's not something you just overnight, you know, say, oh, this is what I should be doing. It's like, it's a constant question. And I think when we lose sight of that question and, and let those questions go is when we essentially get tricked by culture to follow certain uh, norms that are counter to meaning, like trying to impress people or having a nice car or having a humongous house or being impressive somehow. These are usually not meaningful activities in people's lives. And so if, so if you, to avoid being seduced by culture, you have to stay real, really focused on these questions. Am, am I wasting my time right now? Um, you know, what, what do I, this, this, this is my time. That, that's the other thing that I also recommend people do is get angry. This is your time. You have limited time left, goddammit, and you're not going to let some bullshit culture or some bullshit boss at work or some bullshit friend who is an asshole get in your way about your time. You, you have limited time left, and goddammit, you're not going to let other people waste that time for you, and you're not going to waste your time doing things that you, that you don't need to be doing and that are, are wasteful. This is your time, and you're the only one who is going to make it meaningful. No one can come to you and make your life meaningful. This is your time. It's your decision. You know, it's like you go to a restaurant, you sit down and you just like look to other people and say, what do you think I should order? You know, this is your meal. What do you want? This is your life. How do you want to spend it? Get angry about that. Take life by the, you know, the horns and make it yours. Now, it might be a while before you figure out what you want, but you got to think about it. You got to stare at that menu. You got to look at, you got to imagine, okay, do I want a hamburger? Do I want a salad? Do I want a taco? You know, do I want sushi? What do I, what, 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 what do I want? And I talk with people about this all the time. For some people, given their childhoods, they have no idea what they want. And the solution to that isn't to just ignore it. The solution is discover yourself, find yourself, connect with yourself, and find out what you want, and then manifest that. That's what all the existential therapists talked about, Viktor Frankl, others. They're like, this is your life. No one else, you are responsible for that. You, you have freedom, you have responsibility, you have to recognize those things, and you have to make your life yours, because no one else can. All right, let's take a break, and we get back, let's read some more emails. <music> Okay, we're back from the break. A few announcements here. First, if you are not a patron of this podcast yet, and especially if you've been thinking about it, do so now. Go to patreon.com. All you have to do is create an account, and then you can start supporting this podcast and other things, honestly. When you become a when you have an account on Patreon, you can you can support several things that you're probably into. Podcasts, YouTube channels, artists, musicians, this kind of thing. 
it's a wonderful way, uh, kind of a low cost way, really, of being able to support things that you like, including this podcast. So become a patron, go to patreon.com. Also, my book is available on Amazon. It's called Multi Role Clinical Supervision. Also, join the Facebook fan group. Also, like our Facebook page, which is the page I run. Also, if you want the archive of every episode, we've had almost 700 episodes, go to the website. Every episode is on our website, and a list of every episode, the title is on our website as well. As well. We have our 10 year show coming up in August 2018. And yeah, okay. So, next email is from patron uh, Deandria. Uh, Patron Deandria writes, Hi, I am currently halfway through graduate studies to be an LPC, and until recently, I had no idea what population I wanted to work with. Honestly, it was freaking me out because everyone else had such strong opinions, but then I decided that I, I discovered that I wanted to work with teenagers. I would love to hear your thoughts on emerging adulthood, failure to launch, and treatment modalities for working with this new category of development. Okay. Um, yeah, it's totally normal to not know what population that you want to work with. I was sort of like that. When I started out, I wanted to work with musicians. I wanted to work with bands because I was, I am a musician. And at the time in my early mid twenties, I, the, the, the sort of situations I was running into a lot were in a lot of the music uh, groups I was in, there was always like huge drama and problems and, and I found that, if, man, if we if we could pay someone to help us communicate better, uh, not only would we stop fighting, but I'm guessing we might have better, um, you know, better music outcome. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating because the bands I was in, we didn't fight that much. But I knew of a lot of bands that did. And, and, and I thought about like the Beatles and how they broke up and if they had a therapist. And at the time, there was a kind of a funny documentary, The Smashing Pumpkins going to therapy. And then there was that documentary about Metallica going to therapy and stuff. And I just thought, man, that would be a good population to specialize in. And then I graduated and realized there's no market for that. <laughs> <laughs> bands aren't looking for therapists. It's just not a thing. And so, uh, so anyway, you know, it's totally normal, not only to not know what population you want to work with, but also to change to, even if you do have a, an idea to change your mind, because you just don't know what it's like until you actually do it. Right. You could theoretically say, yeah, I think I want to work with kids. And then when you actually work with kids, you're like, Oh, this isn't what I, this isn't what I thought it was, which, you know, makes sense. You just, you just find your way. Okay, so let's talk about, quote-unquote, failure to launch. What do we mean by that? This is a highly cultural notion, by the way. People from different cultures will say completely different things about this. In some cultures, failure to launch means that you, you know, like a, a proper launching, meaning teens, you know, moving out of the house and, and becoming independent, a, a proper launching of a teenager means uh, when you're 18, you move out of the house and you go to college and then you never come back. That's what it was like when I was a kid. And in, in when I was growing up in the, in, when I was a teenager in the eighties, that, that what, that's what launching was. If you lived at home past your senior year in high school, you were a loser in my, in my community. Everyone either uh, went to college or they just moved out and started their life. You know, it's just like 18, boom, you're out. That's it. There's no option. <laughs> Um, you know, maybe you stay at home while you go to school. My sister did that. She, she lived at home and went to UW. Um, but as soon as she was 22, boom, out, you know, it was just, that was just what you did. Like no one, no one stayed in, in the house. It was extremely rare. So, so that was my culture. Now things have changed since then, but there's still, there's still ideas like that. Whereas you have other cultures where certain kids like the oldest kid or the youngest kid never leaves the house and is expected actually it's actually a failure if you're if all your kids move out it's it's actually a success if you manage to keep at least some of your kids at home there are chinese families that i know and korean families that i know where it's just like until you're married and maybe even after you're married you're expected to live with your parents that's just culturally the way that it is and so there are completely different ideas of what is a successful launching. And so we want to be careful as therapists that we don't impose our own cultural notions on other families and label some as non-pathological and some as pathological. There's just a lot of ideas. And when you think about it empirically or sort of 
objectively, what's the what's wrong with a child living with their parent for the rest of their life? There's nothing wrong with that. Now, if you're from the culture that I come from, that doesn't feel right. It's like what that you know, what kind of a loser lives with their parent for the rest of their life? You need to you need to be independent. You need to build your own life. Well, why? You know, objectively, how you know can you can you demonstrate? that that's a fact or is that just a gut feeling you have is that just a cultural notion and it's a cultural notion the same that um you know the way that we dress and the way that we talk like they're all cultural notions and and it's not a it's not it's not objective that men wear pants and women wear skirts right that's not an objective fact it's just a cultural sort of guideline that certain cultures will follow and launching is the same thing so we just have to be careful and really acknowledge people's cultures and also acknowledge what people want some people, and, and the other thing is, even if, you're, even if your culture dictates a particular path and you don't want to do that, that's also a factor, right? You, if you live in the culture that says you need to launch from an early age, but, you're, but your family doesn't want to do it that way, then that's okay. So it's not like culture dictates what's right and wrong. It just, it just means we just have to really question our, our notions as, as therapists and, and of people. And so that, that's very important to take into consideration. The other thing is, is is society. There's just massive amounts of judgment that go on about this sort of thing, regardless of what culture you're in. You know, like in in contemporary Western culture, again, particularly when I was a kid in the 80s, like I said, you were a loser. If you if you were 25 and you lived in your parents' house, you were a loser. In fact, it's a common joke that comedians will make. It's just like, you know, he's 40 years old and he still lives with his parents. It's like, so what? You know, what's, who cares? Like that, what's it to you that this person's living with their parents? It's seen as being immature. It's seen as being a loser, as unsuccessful. And it's like, that is not fair to people. I, you know, feel free to judge people for being mean. Feel free to judge people for bullying or harming other people's murder, assault, sexual assault. Feel free to shame that. But why are, are you choosing to shame people who just families who choose to have their kids live at home? What's the big deal? Like, let it go, people. It's it's not it's not your place to place judgment on that. So there's just a, a ton of, and, and then you'll have Chinese families who will, and not all Chinese fa- people. Obviously, we're talking about over a billion people, but uh, Chinese immigrant families that I've worked with, and Korean immigrant families, where the community will judge them if their kids move out too soon. So. You know, shame and judgment is around the globe, apparently. So there's that. Also, there's this ton of parental comparison that happens. Parents will compare themselves to others. And and the most vocal parents will be parents who are managing to, or their kids choose to fit within the cultural norm. Like, say there's a, you know, you have a friend who has kids who, as soon as they graduated from high school, they went to a four-year university like UW or Harvard or something. And, uh, you know, they'll be very vocal about that. They'll be like, oh, Johnny's, you know, Johnny is going to Kansas State now and he's having this great time. And, you know, he's joining the intramural basketball team and blah, 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 blah. You know, very vocal. You have a a parent who their kid is still living at home. They're not going to talk about it very much because they're going to worry about judgment from other people. And so, so the most vocal people tend to be the people who fit within the culture the, the most precisely, randomly, to some extent. And so what a lot of parents end up having is a very distorted view of, of their community. You know, they're like, well, you know, I, I never hear anyone talk about their kids living at home still, and I only hear about kids when they're, when they're not living at home. Well, there's a reason for that, because the, the people who have been shamed have been shamed to silence, and they don't talk about it. And so you have, in fact, you know, in my anecdotal experience, I would say that, I don't know, half of parents... Uh, with their kids don't launch the way that culture is uh, expecting them to. So, you know, there's that kind of thing. The other uh, thing worth considering when it comes to the idea of failure to launch is the reality of today. It's a, com- you know, it's not completely different, but it is different. It's a different marketplace, a different workplace, a different housing market, particularly in Seattle. Um, you know, there's there's just a... It, in order to when i when i was young when i was in the growing up in the 80s you could conceivably have a career without ever going to college and 
the idea of getting a master's degree was insane. Like pe- what the people I grew up with, um, I don't even think I knew about master's degree when I was uh, when I was in the eighties. It was just like, why would you get a master's degree? It's like, you know, four years of college is long enough. And and a lot of jobs, that's all you needed. You just you just needed a four year degree, and then you were good for the rest of your life. Now it's different, right? You know, four year degrees are no longer. Uh, all that is necessary. And people are getting more and more education uh, and their resumes are looking more and more impressive. And, you know, so, um, so that is another reality that will keep some kids dependent on their parents, right? Because they need to be in school for a lot longer. Also, there's a lot of expectations around like internships while you're in college and and, um, you know, working for no pay and all this kind of stuff. And so it's just, a, and, the, and housing is a lot more expensive, which means rent is a lot more expensive. And it, it's just, it's relative to, you know, real dollars of the past. And so, again, especially in Seattle and other um, areas like, like Seattle, like New York or San Francisco or something. And so all those need to be taken into consideration. It was just easier for people to become independent back then financially. Um, so, so there's that, but you know, that doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means it, it might take an extra few years to kind of get things going. Um, plus in our, in our current societal culture of today and the United States anyway, is, uh, particularly among privileged people is there's just a lot of really stupid messages that are going on. Um, they're not bad messages, but they're overemphasized in a really stupid way. You know, pe- people will tell kids and, and young adults, you know, look, you know, you got to find your passion. You know, you, you need to make your life meaningful. You got to, you know, it's funny because I was just talking about this earlier, but my, my you know, they're like, you got to love your job. You got to give back to the world and your job has to be impressive and your job has to provide like something good. It has to like make the world a better place. And, you know, that and, and there's all these sort of unspoken rules, like your job better look good on Instagram and it better look good on LinkedIn, you know, better be impressive to your um, to your childhood friends, because we're all, you know, we're all public. When I was a kid, no one had any idea what anyone was doing because the internet didn't exist. You know, it was just like, you're just free to have as, as stupid of a career as you wanted and as unimpressive as you wanted, because no one noticed there was just the only way anyone would know what you did is if they, if they had actual physical contact with you, which is actually a pretty small circle of people. And so, so there's 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 a lot of different kind of pressures on kids today, and also these messages, particularly among privileged white people, to um, and maybe privileged Asians and um, and and other people like that, where it's just like you need to have like a, a super meaningful, all encompassing career that you know has all these different nuances and you know da 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 da, and they're telling people that when they're 18 or 22, and it's like um, when you start out in life the jobs that you qualify for are shit jobs. I mean, one of the best things my grandfather ever told me, because he was a self-made guy, and I was struggling when I was 22. I was talking with him, and I was just like, yeah, you know, I, I'm just I'm just having a hard time because I'm not really finding my career, and you know, I find that the only jobs I can really qualify for are these, you know, just these really terrible jobs. Um, like when I, I graduated from UW with a business degree, and the best job I could find that would actually hire me was working at Foot Locker. <laughs> I was a salesperson at Foot Locker at the Westlake Mall in downtown Seattle, and and it was commissions only. There was it wasn't um, it wasn't you know hourly wages or salary. It was commission, and I ended up getting paid like half of the um, minimum wage because. Uh, not a lot of people came into the store and, and um, there just wasn't enough opportunity for commissions, honestly. And plus I wasn't super pressury cause I just didn't want to do that. But, uh, but I did get a sweet outfit out of the job. I, you know, polyester pants and uh, that checkered shirt that was rad. But anyway, um, so I was talking with my grandfather and he was like, when I started, I was the cement mixer. And then I moved up to, the, you know, this guy, and then I moved up to this guy, and then I moved up to foreman, and then I moved up to contractor, that I had my own contracting business. And it's, you know, it's a slow grind, but you got to start at the shit jobs first. That's just the reality. How many times have you seen that been, how many times have you heard that being told to a young adult? Um, You know, someone trying to inspire a young adult by saying like, um, you know, you're going to take some shit jobs. You're, you know, the first, for the first 10 years of your life, you're going to hate your job. 
you're, you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, oh, I got to go to work. And that's just the reality because you got to put in your time. You got to do the work. How many times do people say that? I've never heard anyone say that to kids. I'm sure it gets told to kids like the way my grandfather did. And that really helped me because I looked up to him a lot because he, he had a you know pretty cool career. And I was like, oh, makes sense. So that's when I started taking really shit jobs and like understanding like, well, this is where you start. You know, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. How could it be any other way different than that? Of course you start at the bottom because you're shit. And, uh, you know, this belief that like, oh, I have a, I have a four year degree and I, you know, I have a degree and blah, blah, blah. That doesn't mean anything in the, in the real world. That just means you, you qualify for the shittiest job at the, at the employment place, you know? You, you, you now qualify for the shittiest job and feel free to start working your way up the ladder from here. You know, that's, that's just the way it works. And, uh, and when my grandfather told me that, I was like, oh, makes sense. And so it, it, it sucked. I didn't like working from the bottom and working my way up, but, it, but I was like, well, but this is the process. Whereas now you have all these messages for young adults, like find your purpose and, you know, Find the thing that you don't notice you're working and you found your career. And it's just like, um, you know, it's, again, it's not bad advice. I just got done talking about how I, I, you know, people should think about that sort of thing. But you got to also think about the big picture, right? Um, you know, if, if I thought, so in, in sort of dovetailing this with the existential question around retirement and that kind of thing, when I was 24 and I was, you know, had a job and I in business and I was thinking, okay, what do I really want to do with my life? What I didn't say is how can I have my most perfect job within a few months? That's not what I said. I said, how can I eventually get to the perfect job? You know, what do I need to do to, to sort of explore that and get there? You know? Um, and that's what I did. I invested the time in no assuming and hoping that I would live long enough to manifest my, um, perfect sort of career, uh, you know, in time. And so that's a whole, so that whole has to be balanced out anyway. So, so that's another sort of factor when it comes to launching that a lot of kids, a lot of young adults right now, I see them paralyzed even up till into their thirties by these notions because they don't really understand the process of building a career. And they don't understand that sometimes you have to take jobs that are shit. And sometimes you just have to choose something because you need to earn money so you can be independent. And uh, they're not necessarily being told those messages. So, so it's a matter of messaging to, to children and our society isn't always helping that. Um, also, uh, the other thing that I think what patron DeAndrea is talking about is that it's, that's sort of, I don't know if you were saying this patron, but it kind of sounds like you're saying it's a bigger problem now. And there's a lot of ideas out there. It's like, oh, it's a bigger problem now. You know, it's hard to know if it's a bigger problem now. I, I, in my career, um, for the 20 plus years, it's always been a problem. I, um, and it'd be, a, it'd be a hard thing to measure in terms of like a bigger problem today than before. I, I remember early on in my career talking with parents about this. It's, it's just a, it's just a common thing, right? You know, so, um, uh, so I, I don't, I, I, I hesitate to say that it's a, it's a new phenomenon. Although I think there are some other factors involved, like um, the fact that you have the internet and video games and tons of entertainment that can be had in your bedroom. When I was a kid, I had basically like kind of two things to do in my bedroom that was entertaining. I, I had a tiny little black and white, like 10 inch TV that had just like a couple fuzzy channels because I didn't have cable in my bedroom. And I also had my uh, clock radio, which had mono speaker and a cassette deck inside. It was a clock radio with a cassette deck and a radio. And I, eventually I had my own stereo in my room. But anyway, I had music, which I loved, but limited music because I had to have records or because um, and I didn't really get CDs until I was in college. And, and just limited, just, just limited things to do in your bedroom. And so if I wanted to enter, and I had no contact with my friends, I had my phone, so I should take that back. I did have my phone that I could call people, but eventually you want to actually interact, you know, more meaningfully with your friends. And so I was constantly trying to get out of the house. That's all I spent, you know, um, my senior year, like pretty much always out of the house, um, whether it was with sports or friends or parties or, um, get-togethers or whatever, you know, it was just like today, if I grew up today, 
I'm positive, I would be like, I would, you know, I'd have my own TV in my room. I would have my own cell phone, internet, computer, um, video games, uh, you know, FaceTime, all this stuff. You can, you can have a rich life without ever leaving your bedroom as a teenager today, particularly if you're a boy because of the sort of socialization around that. And so that's another factor that's, that's not helping, you know, um, and and to some extent, when you actually suggest to young people that they need to leave their house, you're actually suggesting that they rip themselves away from the few social contacts that they have, because they're, the few social contact, contacts that they actually have built are online. And so by leaving the house, you're actually not helping the situation to some extent. But anyway... So some advice about this topic of, you know, launching and failure to launch in addition to what I've already said is that everyone should be very careful about charlatans. There's a lot of charlatans on the internet that I, uh, you know, have seen who claim to know the, you know, the answers to this sort of thing. There's no answers to this. Again, particularly because you have to think about culture and, and every family is different. And so I've seen people say like, I have an, I have the way to help launch your kids. And it's like anyone who says that they're either stupid or they're lying. So just, just be very careful about people who claim to know answers to this. Cause there's, it's very subtle and it's very personal. It's case by case basis. And you know, it's complicated. Uh, I recommend that people actually, um, you know, go to therapists who specialize in this. Patron DeAndrea will, it sounds like she's going to eventually um, graduate and specialize in this. Uh, you can't just go to a regular therapist because it it's not guaranteed that, one, they won't understand the culture of it, and two, they won't understand all the different nuances. Because a lot of people have a very simplistic view of this. It's just like, well, you know, you got to draw a boundary with your kid and just make it happen. And certainly that that can be an answer, but that isn't often um, the answer in my experience. Because there are system forces involved in the family system and the societal system. Uh, you know, and this, I haven't even mentioned the fact that you have bullying or you have uh, racism or sexism that's involved and um, ableism. Uh, learning disabilities, you know, there's a lot of factors that can play into a child avoiding leaving their house, you know, it's safe in your house. Um, Family therapy is often necessary because the relationship between the children and the parents is, is often a source of the reason why there's dissatisfaction. The, the thing that I'll say is that for most kids, particularly in mainstream Western cultures, the kids want to launch. They, they want to go out into the world. So this so you have to assume that, that you know, most people, the vast majority of people want to be independent. They want that self-esteem. They want that freedom. They want a job. They, they want to be normal. They, they want to not live at their parents' house, depending on their culture. And so, so what is getting in the, in the way of that? If you have a kid who is ignoring that and not doing anything toward that, then you have to say like, well, what's getting in the way of their natural desire to be independent? Because most people do. I mean, from, from day one, children, infants and, and preschool kids and you know, grade school kids are always moving towards independence. They're, they're just like, um, you know, leave me alone and I, I can do it myself. And, you know, they, they get self-esteem by being able to tie their shoes or being able to do homework on their own or being able just to go to school and not cry. Like every kid, every step of the way is like, ooh, I'm growing up, I'm doing things. And launching is just another step like that. It's just, launching is just this huge step compared to other steps, you know, like being able to tie your shoes on your own is a small incremental change towards independence. Living by yourself having a career, paying your own bills, earning your own money, you know, these are, this is a huge leap. And again, you don't have to do all those things at once, but, um, but it's, it's a bigger uh, leap, you know, in our society. Um, You know, the relationship between the children and the parents is critical. You have to look at that because there's, there's often a, an emotional systemic element to, dissatisfaction regarding launching. You have kids who might look, you know, totally normally adjusted, but when you actually drill down on their relationships, the the child has been made to feel extremely dependent on their parents. Some parents will not let their children do things because they're afraid for various reasons 
or they're worried about their kids. And so, so some parents will end up doing everything for their kids. Um, and the, the kid will be happy, and the kid will be you know, um, uh, not conflictual, and the kid, you know, won't use drugs, or the kid, you know, the kid from, you know, you just look at the kid, you're like, oh, good kid. But why is the kid um, seemingly so dependent on their parents? Well, because since day one, the parents have basically been socializing the kid to be dependent on the parents, not in a nefarious way necessarily, but in an anxious way. The parents are anxious about their kid doing things on their own. Or you have parents who just really like doing things, really just don't complain. You know, one of the driving forces to make kids do things on your own is when you just get sick and tired of doing things for kids. <laughs> you know, you're just like, uh, you know, your kid is 15 years, years old and they come home from, from school and all they do is sit around and watch TV. Meanwhile, you're doing chores and you're cooking dinner and you're cleaning and you're vacuuming and you're doing the laundry and you're wiping down surfaces and you're, you know, raking the leaves and you're cleaning the gutters and you're mowing the lawn and you're, you know, you're doing all this stuff and you're just sitting there watching your kids sit there laying on the couch watching TV or whatever they're doing. And you just get annoyed with it. You know, you're just like, God fucking damn it, this kid better do something. And, and, and so now some people don't have that impulse. Some parents are just like, um, Eh, you know, it's fine. I don't mind doing the laundry or I don't mind mowing the lawn or it gets me a good chance to get outside. I don't mind doing this or that. And they never actually get pissed off to the point where they engage in some, you know, some kind of parental action to motivate a kid to do chores because it, it, it's hard. You have to actually, why would a kid volunteer to do chores? <laughs> you know, you, you have, to, it's a fight. You, you got to like force kids to do chores and it's, it's not pleasant. That's another thing that some parents have trouble with is like, um, engaging in that uh, helpful power struggle that you have to get into with kids regarding um, making them do chores and making them... Uh, but, but the benefit to that is that when you actually... I'll just give myself, for example. My, my parents, when, when I was 16, 17, um, they came to me and they're like, Kirk, we're no longer buying any of your toiletries. We're not buying your toothpaste, your shampoo your, you know, contact solution, that's all on your own. And it was shocking to me. And looking back, I, f I think my parents had had a meeting or something They're like, oh, let's, let's, um, let's help Kirk out with his independence. And let's, let's, you know, help transition him to launching and buy and this is one small step toward that. Because it's not like my parents were poor, they didn't, they didn't need me to chip in on stuff like that. And it, I didn't buy expensive things. So it was, you know, it's, it's probably a tops like 10 bucks a month, what we're talking about. So that, you know, it wasn't the money. It was, it was them saying, look, um, this is us helping you to move towards independence. And I remember it, it hurt. It, it hurt my feelings. It bothered me. I didn't like it. I was like, this is bullshit. I'm still living at home and my, my friends don't have to buy their, their own shampoo. Why do I have to buy my own shampoo? It was very shocking to me, you know? And then, and then I was like, well, okay, fine. And then I started buying my own shampoo and I was like, huh, shampoo's not that expensive, not a big deal. And uh, this actually kind of feels good. You know, I get a shop for myself. And when I would go into my bathroom, I'd be like, ooh, this is all mine that I chose, that I bought. And it felt good. And I remember pretty quickly realizing, oh, this is a good move. I actually like this. You know, this is makes me feel like an adult. I'm buying my own, my own toiletries, you know, it, it, it felt good. Um, and some parents just, they, they, it just never occurs to them or it's totally antithetical to the way that they parent because they feel ashamed or guilty or, you know, this sort of, it's painful. My, and I, you know, my parents are nice people and I'm sure they didn't, um, you know, do that without some reservation and without some, um, worry or in some guilt, like, Ooh, you know, I, we, um, we like to give things to our kids. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I, you know, I'm a parent and I love my children and I want to give to them and I don't want to, I don't want to make them suffer and I don't want to disappoint them and I don't want them to be, um, you know, uh, burdened. I want them to go to school and I want them to be successful and I'm going to do everything I can to help that. Well, there's nothing wrong with those notions, but that also has to be balanced with efforts to basically force kids to become independent. And if you don't start early with that, and I mean early, I mean like 
13 years old, you're, you got your mind on that, you know, age appropriate transitions, little transitions here and there, make them do their own laundry. They're going to fuck it up at first. That's, that's the other thing is some parents are really uptight about watching kids fuck things up. You know, you you give a kid the opportunity, you know, like, look, you're going to do your own laundry. You're going to do, you're going to wash your own clothes. You're going to wash your own things like that. You know, a lot of parents wisely will have their kids do that at age 16, 17 ish. And again, I just want to do a caveat to all this. I'm basically talking about mainstream Western culture parents who are privileged. There are underprivileged families where at nine years old, you have to do your own laundry because your parent, you know, it's a single parent family and your mom works all day. So someone, your mom can't do the laundry. So, so I'm, I'm really talking about privileged families in this instance. Um, partially, I guess, because I've never had a problem with marginalized families and launching. That's interesting because I've worked with a lot of marginalized families and the launching issue does not look the same. You won't find a, you know, um, I've never seen like a Mexican immigrant family who lives in a two bedroom apartment with, you know, four kids and, you know, an uncle lives there. I've never seen someone fail to launch in that situation. Um, probably because of a lot of different reasons that are inherent to their situation. You know, it's like they have to fend for themselves. They learn independence early. There's, there's no room for them in, in the small little, you know, place. Um, they, they probably don't have a TV in their room and all that kind of stuff, which, you know, raises some questions about how we're raising our kids today, you know? Um, but anyway, so, so there's just a lot of different attitudes, a lot of different um, dependency moves and that parents will make that they're, they're, they come from a good place. They come from a place of love and from a place of wanting to make things easy for their kids. But what they deny is the kids and their opportunity to grow up. You know, launching isn't a it doesn't happen overnight. It's something that you transition a child toward and and you need to start early, you know, like when the kid's 15 and they get um, like, a, so another thing to think about is homework. Some parents will hover over their kids around homework well into college. They'll be like, you know, did you, did you do this homework assignment? Did you know, did you do that? And it's like, at what point do you let a child fall on their face so that they can learn themselves that they need to actually be organized around their homework? Um, now some kids have ADHD and you need to help them out a little bit with that. But, but these are all just questions you just have to ask yourself, you know, what am I doing as a parent that is helping a child uh, extend themselves, grow up and learn from their mistakes? Because again, the idea is, is that all kids want to launch, all kids want to be independent, all kids don't want their parents to have to tell them what to do. And so when you give kids, but it's a transition, like with me and buying my own shampoo, it hurt. And it, it challenged my relationship with my parents in that moment. But we got through it, and I was better off for it. They made the right decision. It bothered me at first, but it was good for me in the end, and I saw that pretty quickly. And so uh, parents have to do that, and, you, and it's a strategy, and it's a, it's a campaign you go on. You don't just suddenly make a kid independent. It's a very slow, gradual process. Um, in terms of actual clients I've worked with, what I have found is that, so they'll have like a, you know, a 27 year old, it's off, it's, it, it's universally uh, young men. I, I've never worked with a family with a failure to launch with a, a young woman. I'm, I'm sure it happens, but for some reason it's often young men. Um, I could speculate as to the gender socialization issues around that, but anyway, um, what I find is that the parents come to me and they're like, you know, I need help launching my kid because this is ridiculous. My kid is, you know, mooching off me and being dis- – there's often an element of disrespect too. The, the kids um, sometimes are – they eventually get kind of nasty to the parents because they're just like, back off, you know. And, um, oh, another massive issue to consider is anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression are extremely common and – it stands to reason that a number of these quote unquote failure to launch people are suffering from anxiety, depression, PTSD, other kinds of things, and they're, they're untreated. And 
the idea of living outside of the house is just so overwhelming to them that it provokes the depression, provokes the, it triggers their trauma, uh, makes them anxious to the point where they're paralyzed and they they just can't. It's just it's just too overwhelming to them, and so without any treatment, they end up uh, it ends up looking like a lazy kid or a lazy young adult, but in reality, they're they're truly truly suffering. So uh, so that's another issue that I've seen. I mean, the the way that it ends up working is it's like you know, you say are anxious, you, you're socially anxious. And while you're in high school, you just kind of have to deal with it because your, your life, your Monday through Friday, you're just exposed to all these social issues at school that, you know, your social anxiety doesn't spin out of control because um, you're constantly being exposed to social situations and realizing that it's not that big of a deal. But then, you know, you graduate from high school and then maybe you do some online courses for college or maybe one community, you know, college course or something like that. And, you know, you don't have to interact with people in that way. Once you're in college, you, you choose to interact with people or you can choose to isolate. It's, it's not hard. So it's not hard to isolate past high school. And now you're in a situation where, you know, a month, a few months, a couple years after graduation, you might have had very little contact with other human beings and your social anxiety just gets worse and worse and worse because the few times you have left the house, you, the thing, things haven't gone well because you know, you're socially anxious. You've been traumatized socially or something. And so uh, fast forward another five years, you've had no contact with the outside world. You've, the only self-esteem you have is with video games the, the only sense of accomplishment you get is through video games, which video games are perfectly designed to provide you with, by the way. And you, you, you're paralyzed, and, and you're just like, okay, at home it's safe. I have my video games. I have my internet. I have my, you know, I, I get food whenever I want it. And leaving the house and working at a job or actually interacting with people is terrifying to me. It's terrifying for some people. And, and that's a real thing. It's not just like, get up off your ass and get outside. It's like, you know, it, it's akin to, it, you know, if you're terrified of spiders and you have a, you know, some of the listeners are terrified of spiders. It's akin to just saying, you know, jump into that tank full of spiders. Do it now. It's like, no, uh, the people will do anything to get out of that. And they'll say anything and they'll fight you and they'll tell you you're a piece of shit. And then they end up coming to me as a therapist and saying, my kid won't leave the house and uh, they're refusing the thing. So what I do with parents in the situation like this is I say, look, and I might explain all this in a more concise way that I've already explained, but I'll also say, look, we have to go on a campaign. There, there has to be a, a system here. And, at, and the campaign has to be, you know, uh, encouragement toward independence. So you have to lay out a plan for the kid because a lot of parents don't do this. A lot of parents just very briefly in these very rageful moments just be like, um, you know, you got to get out of this house. Or, you know, just just very quick kind of statements and and not, you know, they, they rarely will develop a campaign and, and explain it to the kid. And so what I do is I say, you know, this might be a few meetings of you meeting with me, but um, we're going to explore what you want and, and what you expect and what your timeline is. And, and once you establish that, you're going to present it to, the, to your kid, to your young adult who's living in the house. And in that plan is going to be consequences. You have to have real consequences. Otherwise, it probably won't work because you've already tried, you know. So the campaign, I, you know, that we might develop is something like uh, the parent sits down with the kid and says, I love you, I care about you, and I, I really need you to be independent and move out of the house because I'm ready to move on in the next phase of my life, which doesn't involve taking care of kids all day. So, so here's what's going to happen. Uh, we're, you know, over the next number of months, we're going to slowly transition towards you being independent, and I'll help you. And it won't be a clean break. It'll be, you know, I'll pay for your first few months of rent. And, uh, but after that, I'm not. And you're not welcome to live in my house anymore. Um, you know, if there's an emergency, you know, like you get diagnosed with cancer or something and you have to move back home, okay, fine. But anything, you know, short of an emergency, um, you got to figure this out on your own. And I believe in you. Um, but I also am sorry that I haven't really helped prepare you for that. So here's what we're going to do. Um, 
uh, I, I expect you to get a job and I can help you with that. And I can, you know, I, I'm here to help and we, we can work on that, but you need to get a job. And then once you get a job, you need to save money and, you know, you start, you start working, you start working on a timeline and everything has like a deadline. And then, um, and then, and then the parent says, and if you don't follow uh, this step by this date or this step by this date, date then I'm going to give you 30 days and then you, you're going to be kicked out of the house. And that's going to be the, it. It. Uh, I, I'm sorry for that. I, I really hope it doesn't come to that. And there's a total way to avoid all that by just following my my timeline here. It's totally attainable. But if, if you don't do this by this date, I'm going to give you 30 day notice and you're going to be out. And if you refuse to leave the house, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to call the police or I'm going to you know, do this or that or blah, blah, blah. Um, so, some parents actually have the luxury of, of even moving out of the house. What they'll do is they'll be like... Um, you know, they'll tell their kid, uh, in six months, we're going to sell the house and we're going to move into an apartment uh, that won't actually accommodate you. And so, um, and you can't live with us in the apartment. So uh, you have six months to find your own place because I'm actually, we're actually selling this place or we're actually not going to rent this place again. Um, so some parents actually have that luxury. Now, again, all this is done with love because it's going to be painful for the kid. So you have to really pour on the love and attention and, you know, listen to their outcries or whatever. And you just, you know, you work with them on that. And then you say, and, you know, if you, if you have uh, some issues about this, I, I welcome you to, to work with a therapist, but that's up to you, you know. Um, there are therapists who can, you know, you can talk to this therapist that we were talking to. He seems to have a, a compassion for your situation. I recommend you talk with him, but that's up to you. You can either go to the therapist or not. And, but I'm guessing therapy would help you at least to meet a few times. Um, and I'd be happy to pay for it, blah, blah. So now, um, a lot of parents are like, Ooh, I like that. That sounds good. But then I ask him this question. I'm like, okay, so let's just say worst case scenario your kid does nothing. They don't do a single thing on this list that you've laid out. And the parents are like, well, but, you know, but I, I hope that they won't, you know, and I'm like, well, there's a good chance they won't. I mean, if track record shows that, you know, that they, they might not do any of this stuff. And, the, and then I'm like, okay, so worst case scenario, which is, which very well could happen. They don't do a single thing on here. They don't get a job. Uh, when the time comes for the deadline, they don't, they've done nothing. They've done nothing. Are, the question I ask the parents is, are you actually prepared to kick your kid out? Will you actually call the police? Will you actually put their stuff out on the lawn and kick them out of your house? Will you actually do that? And the parents will say, uh, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. And when they say, I don't know, I say, you're not going to do it. Because even if you told me right now, you're 110% sure you will do it. When the time comes, you're probably not going to do it. <laughs> so if you don't know you're going to do it now, I can guarantee you you're not going to do it once the time comes. So the so then if so then they so then you know they're like, "Well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to do it." And then I say, "Well, then we can't move forward until you come to grips with that because it might come to that." And your kid will know that you're not serious if you if you don't have that as a um, consequ uh, ultimate consequence, you know, and um, and until you grieve that loss or accept that uh, reality or whatever it is you need to do to get there, um, until we get there, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no use in laying out a campaign to the kid because. You know, you follow through on the campaign, but then when the time comes to kick the kid out, you don't kick the kid out, then where are you? Then the next campaign you go on, the kid's going to think you're not serious. And then, so there's no point in going through with any of this until you can fully accept that that might be what you have to do. And maybe that'll take two years of therapy and, and exploration and soul searching to come to grips with that. You know, maybe, and, and I've done that with parents. I've, I've worked with them for years before they're like, okay, now I'm done. I've, I've exhausted all of my resources emotionally and, and parenting wise. I, I'm ready. And I'm ready to tell my kid if they don't get their shit together in a month, they're out. I have, I have no problem with that. I, you know, my kid is just being a complete asshole. They're basically bullying me. I'm trapped in my own house. This is fucking bullshit and blah, blah, blah. So maybe it takes a while before parents get to that point. 
But um, w- so that's another possibility that I haven't talked about is that some kids are actually abusing their parents by staying in their house. I mean, that I put it in a better way. You have abusive kids towards their parents who are also um, l- refusing to leave the house. You know, they're, they're basically, um, they, have, they have sort of a domestic violence personality or attitude, and they are basically, um, in a sense, kind of terrorizing their parents and just not and disrespecting them. So, there are that. so there's a lot of different reasons as to why kids have failure to lunch. There's, there's plenty of other kids who would never harm a fly, let alone their parents, and, and are just anxious or feeling... Um, unconfident or anyway. So, so I might meet, I might talk with parents for a long time before they can really accept the reality of having to kick a kid out. Now, what I tell parents is, is that if you do this right, it might not come to that, but that all depends on, on the, on the decisions that your child makes. If your adult child, and I try to always um, frame it that way, I, 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 as a sort of subtle socialization, I, I'll say like, your 27-year-old uh, son who is a man now, um, who lives in your house, uh, you know, I try to phrase it that way, not as your child, because that implies, you know, little children that um, are justifiably dependent. But anyway, so so I'll say, um, so... You know, uh, if your if your twenty seven year old son decides that your campaign isn't going to work, then it's just not going to work, and there's nothing you can do about it other than the ultimate price, which is to kick him out of the house. And you know, and and then I lay it all out. I'm like, okay, so when in my experience, what I've seen is that when kids are kicked out of the house, they go through a number of phases. The first, they're they're angry, they're not happy about it. And then they probably will find a friend's couch to sleep on for a couple months. And then the friend will get sick of them. And then, you know, and then, and then your 27 year old son starts to really, you know, grow up and it's not hard to get a job at Subway. It's not hard to rent a one bedroom apartment for, you know, a cheap price, or it's not hard to, you know, go on Craigslist and find a house that you can share a room in. It's not ideal. It's not going to be something he likes, but it's the reality of the world. And and he'll learn and, he, and he'll look back at you and he'll thank you for having done this because, you know, five years later, he's got a job, he has his own place, he, he has a career and he's he's building a life and he's happy and he'll be happy that you actually helped him by by doing this to him. Uh, that's often what happens, and, and that and that is what happens. I've never seen a kid get kicked out and have things go the way that parents will catastrophize it as. You know, parents will catastrophize. He'll be a bum on the street, and he'll become a heroin addict, and he'll die. You know, and it's just like I've never seen that happen. Um, you know, people people learn fast. Okay, here's what I have to do. Particularly, twenty seven year old men. <laughs> the the other thing that I'll say is, I, as a as a man myself. I will I will tell my clients what I was like when I was a young man. I will say, you know, things like, um, uh, you know, I'll I'll just tell like, well, when I was twenty seven, here's what my life looked like, um, and it wasn't the way it is now, but it, you know, this is what I did, and I didn't like this, you know. I'll just I'll model I'll use modeling myself and and, and say like. Um, I never cleaned my bathroom because I would as I was a disgusting twenty seven year old, but. I did pay my own bills and I did think about my career and, you know, so there were some immaturities and, and some maturities and, and, and what they often will look at me and they'll be like, well, he's a successful therapist now, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, oh, he, it looks like he had some transitions too. Uh, maybe I can help with my own kids. So some modeling and some normalization around some things can help uh, parents too. But again, it takes time. And, uh, and then now all of this is basically assuming that the kid does not want help, by the way. Um, cause, cause a lot of times the, the adult child living at home refuses to go to therapy. A lot of times that's the case because they're often immature and they don't think there's anything wrong with them or they're afraid of therapy or whatever. Um, but there are situations where the adult child living at home and wants to launch will actually want to go to therapy. Um, there, there are young adults who come to me without their parents at all and just say like, I, I feel like I, I feel like I'm stagnating. I need help. So, so in those situations, it's much easier, right? Because the young adult actually wants help and wants to explore and, and, 
in once you have that buy-in and and they're at that stage of change, it's so much easier to to work with a situation like that. Mainly what I've been talking about is a situation where the kid, the adult child living at home, does not want to leave. They don't want to go to therapy. They're they're stubborn. They're sort of digging their heels in. Um, that's usually when the parents will hire me anyway. So um, that is that. I will conclude by providing the sort of caveat that I provided earlier, which is that this is a cultural thing. And for some families, for some people, it is completely okay to decide that they want to have their kid live with them for the rest of their life. And there's no reason why that should be a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with a 27-year-old adult child living with their parents. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with someone uh, never leaving their parents' house, never getting married, and never getting a job. There's there's nothing objectively wrong with someone who decides to never get a job and never get their own place and never move out of their parents' house. There's nothing objectively wrong with that. Just like there's nothing objectively wrong with a 60-year-old person marrying a 30-year-old person. There's nothing scientifically objectively wrong with that. And our culture has a lot of weird notions about all that stuff. So, so, so there's nothing wrong with that. But most, if not the vast majority, 90 plus percent of young adults who are living in their parents' house, they actually want to move out. And when they move out, they feel much better about themselves. And there's a barrier getting in the way. And they just need either a push or some extra help to get there. And they they like it, you know. I, I've never been with a family through this transition where a couple of years later the kid is like, um, I was I want to move back home, you know. As in my experience, within weeks after the kid is kicked out, the kid's like, Oh my god, I love living outside my parents' house. No one's breathing down my neck. I'm I feel like I'm an adult now. I can do what I want. And like, you know, kids in and they're like, I, I never realized it was so easy to live outside my parents' house. And so I, you know. That's what we're talking about here is where people actually want to move and they are just having trouble with that with that step and you know and sometimes that requires a drastic kind of move you know anyway so that does it for that episode of psychology in Seattle thanks for joining me out there please take care of yourself because you deserve it. Mm-hmm.